Day 215 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as Russia's brutal war against Ukraine. Jossie here, and today is another quick update as I like to take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine today. And as always, we like to start off with some of the Russian losses. So in terms of the military personnel losses, we are currently sitting at 57,200. So if we were to just snip back there, that's an extra 500 or so Russian military personnel losses there in the last day. Then we'll have a quick look at the hardware losses on the Russian side as well. So for armored combat vehicles, we've got an additional 25 losses. Then for the tanks, we've got a uh, fairly whopping 15 tank losses, one artillery and uh, one aircraft and four helicopters. And I'll show you a little bit of information about that shortly there as well. And uh, just quickly before I move across to the map, uh, another quick look at my homegrown hobby of Ukrainian captured equipment. So left idle, abandoned, but in working condition from Russia, quote unquote, donated to the Ukrainian armed forces. Only a few small updates here today. Sometimes they, well, they certainly come in dribs and drabs, some days bigger than others. It all depends on the procurement process, how it does work. Something I'll get into another video, I'm sure, later. But starting off, we'll jump across to the map to begin with. Here we go. And we'll start off in the Kharkiv Oblast, as we sometimes do. Now, technically, there's a, a bit more action happening around just below the Kharkiv Oblast in the Donetsk Oblast, but uh, we'll have a look here. So what we do know is uh, east, east of Kupiansk, uh, particularly this settlement here, Petropavlivka, this is where the Ukrainian forces are currently are pushing through. Now, if we go down to the very south of the, the Oskil River, we'll see some changes there. Oh, but before we do, now there's always more loot discovered, found, available on the Kharkiv side here. Now, which means what I'll just quickly show you firstly is the, the uh, a captured Russian T-80U tank found in the Kharkov Oblast there, which is nice to see. Then, this next one is of a burning Russian R33 or 330ZH Zytel Electronic Warfare Complex. So this one is like a, a comms truck in a way. Designed as a jamming communication station. So pretty rare find or something rare to be blown up doesn't happen every day. And we've got a, a quick video here of uh, what is believed to be in the Kharkiv Oblast as well. Now these are Ukrainian Georgian uh, Legion forces who recovered a, a captured Russian BMP-3M and a, a, a Ural truck. A Ural, these are the pretty common 4320 trucks there. So basically we've got a truck and an infantry fighting vehicle. Now, probably best to just quickly mention the Ukrainian Georgian Legion forces are, of course, they're, they're fighting on the Ukrainian side as well, just so you know about that one. Now, we'll move across a little bit down to the Donbass region there. So this is really where the, the Russian military is reportedly sending conscripts already to the front lines of Ukraine, particularly the Donbass for starters. Now, as you may remember, the mobilization orders from Putin, uh, President of Russia, came through only last week, the 21st of September. Now, there was meant to be a month of training for Russian soldiers. Uh, these are conscripts that aren't really kept up to date on uh, their their previous learnings, so conscripted into uh, the sort of training in the in the in the Russian armed forces potentially many years ago. So they were reservists that, that needed training to get back into the action. But a lot of them, including uh, these ones that I'm reporting on now, didn't seem to, to get that. So there was meant to be a, a month of training. I think that was, uh, that was said on multiple locations on the Russian side. And let's say the NATO or the West side saying, yeah, these guys are going to get a month of training. Then someone in the Russian army, someone up high a few days ago said, yeah, two weeks of training for our, our Russian soldiers. Uh, our reservists to go onto the front line, two weeks should be sufficient. But it appears some of these conscripts are now getting, I guess you'd call it, on the drop. 
on the job training instead. Sorry, I, I'm trying not to laugh. I guess because uh, in my office job, in real life, I've been saying on the job training, aka trial by fire, is the best way to learn sometimes. But I mean trial by fire as metaphorical terminology. It's a little bit more literal uh, in terms of the front lines that these Russian conscripts are, are going on to at the moment. So, not a great strategy. But uh, since we do have some uh, Russian troops uh, going to the front line now already, just within days of the partial mobilization announcement on the Russian side, what the Russian uh, military is probably doing is just in a mad dash uh, to rush or fill frontline quotas. So technically an upfront supply of, of cannon fodder. Now, later troops on the Russian side in a few months that, that would be sort of trickling through would surely have some additional training, but only time will tell. Russia has done some strange things in the past and they continue to do so. Oh, and I might round this whole segment off with uh, saying a, a line from a Ukrainian soldier from a few months ago referring to the Russian soldiers saying, we're, not, we're lucky they're not so clever. And that's paraphrased, of course. Uh, referring to those Russian forces. Now what we're going to do is take a little bit of a quick look at the date map, see what's going on here for the Donbass. There was a bit of a push here, so to the south of the Oskel River on the uh, on the east side there, we can see quite a change there, which is nice to see. In fact, when you have a think about it and you zoom in, you can see Lehman is right there. Now, it's not exactly a full encirclement, at least from a, a, from a, a tight, not far away perspective. But it is getting pretty close and Lehman uh, should be now. No, I'm not going to say to do tomorrow or next week, but uh, the Russian oinky pigs or the troops stationed on this side, the Russian forces, they're going to potentially have some tough decisions to make. Uh, not the least is which is do they surrender? Do they perform a massive pullback from this location or just eliminate it? from being forced to stay on the on the front lines. And that's actually something I'll just quickly mention there. So, of course, the saddest part in all of this is what Russian commanders are saying to their Russian frontline infantrymen. Uh, effectively, they're saying not one step back. So truly Russian cannon fodder, uh, made to stay at the front line. Otherwise, there, there's even been some reports of threats on these Russian infantry on the front line that if they do retreat or if they do step back, they'll just get shot by the commanders. So they are in between uh, a uh, rock and a hard place, perhaps, too. Now, just in this really specific area here, so Lehman, I'll give you a bit of a video example of what's actually happening there. So just earlier this morning, quite early this morning, uh, the there was the targeted destruction by the Ukrainian armed forces of key positions of the Russian forces in the Lehman uh, settlement there. So yeah, fairly high precision targeting to effectively uh, push the Russians out of there. Now we'll jump up and out a bit. Uh, I don't talk about it too much. It is happening quite a bit, but the, the, the real main front lines of the war typically are actually along here, what I used to call the vertical front line there. So we've got places like Solidar and uh, Bakhmut, all of these places that uh, usually get, get hit pretty strongly. So a lot of, it's probably good to mention a lot of the uh, Ukrainian citizens in this whole region. In fact, this whole Donbass area, so this, uh, I'll zoom out just to give you a better idea of it. This last bit here that Russia really, really wants to take, but they've just been unsuccessful in doing so. A lot of uh, war, it's like a war-torn region with war, war refugees. So Ukrainians going to other parts of the country or indeed in many cases to other European countries. Now, as with the combat losses that I've shown you a moment ago, this is where it gets pretty interesting down the south region in Kherson. So where do we have it right here? So the Ukrainian armed forces shot down a Russian Su-25 attack aircraft right at Berislav, right there. Then what happens? A Russian Mi-8 helicopter goes from the south side to the north side because this is bridge is completely destroyed. You can't get really anything through it. Uh, yeah, these Mi-8 Russian helicopters, or, or a single one, actually went across to 
to uh, rescue the pilot, as we understand. But what happened there? When the helicopter was trying to do that, uh, the Ukrainian forces took out the helicopter as well. And all of this happens uh, not so surprisingly on the north bank of the Dnipro River here, where there's a lot of Russians staged here, but they are sort of cut off in a way because of these bridges connecting the north side to the south side uh, are just not in any sort of usable condition. You're not going to get any heavy tanks, trucks, ordnance, all sorts of things there. There might be a little walking bridge, but that, that's about all you're going to get if you're a Russian trying to traverse between the north side to supply your troops and the south side to, to retreat potentially. So Russia's Backup mode of transport has indeed been a helicopter, and that is very unsafe, very dangerous for the, the helicopter pirate, the pilot to, to go to the north side here where they can get hit by stingers or, or some sort of Ukrainian uh, arms, and it's, yeah, it's just not safe. Now, if you've been watching this channel or any other channel, what Russians have been attempting to do is say, A, fix the bridge, B, build a pontoon bridge, C, uh, create a barge, or D, uh, try some sort of land-related crossing, but it's just been too difficult there. So they've, yeah, we, we have a lot of Russian forces on the north side that are dealing with many supply issues, you know. Now I'll just quickly move across to Odessa. It's not every day I talk about Odessa, but uh, we have some information where the Russian army attacked Odessa. Uh, overnight with uh, several drones. Now these are likely some of the Iranian drones that sometimes get through. Two did actually get through, hit some military objects we're told, causing a fire, and uh, one was shot down by an air defense. So Russia's got about 300 of these in my basic count. In fact, I, I could actually find these details, but they've lost 10, 20, 30, maybe even 40 at this point. So that would account for maybe 20% uh, perhaps, 15-20% uh, of their, their total supply of these types of things. It could even be higher, I'm just trying to give it a, uh, a, a conservative estimate at the moment. In fact, I'll find that out for you guys shortly in the upcoming videos. Because once Ru Russia runs out of these Iranian-made drones, uh, yeah, they're going to have some issues. They're, they're going to need resupply and it may not be that easy for them. And now we'll move across to the news, bit of a quicker video today. So President Zelensky of Ukraine confirms in an interview with CBS News that the first of the NASAMs, uh, advanced air defense systems, have been delivered to Ukraine. Now there are conflicting reports about this. They are meant to come in a month or two, but uh, I guess we'll never know until they're already there. And there is different versions of these. This may be the second generation, as I understand there's a third generation there as well. Depends on the missiles being used, but they've basically got like a 30 uh, mile radius around them. In fact, they go up to 80 miles of radius. They're meant to be quite high precision, quite quite helpful in terms of uh, protecting the skies from, from Russian missile attacks, for instance. And in some other news, again, the ISW uh, has advised that uh, Russia is unlikely to overcome fundamental structural challenges with its own mobilization. So the Institute for the Study of War reported that Russia is unlikely to overcome these fundamental structural changes as Russia attempts to, to mobilize a large number of people to continue its invasion in Ukraine. Now, Russia in the past obviously had some, some setbacks with getting, say, 50,000 Russians in at a time at the beginning of the special operation. We've had traffic jams all the way from uh, the border to Kiev and all sorts of things. So just imagine doing 300,000. In fact, some reports suggest that uh, Russia can mobilize up to 1 or 1.2 million. It's, it's hidden on their declaration, so we can't exactly see how much uh, they're mobilizing. They, they've said with their mouths 300, but uh, it's in a decree that it has appeared to be a lot higher than that. Now in some other news, so the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, told CBS News as well that uh, the, the US has made it clear to Russia that the consequences of using nuclear weapons would be horrific, quote unquote. Now, Secretary Blinken did not share how the US would respond if Russia used nuclear weapons uh, against Ukraine, but uh, said the administration had a plan if, if that were to be the case. Now, further news regarding Russia's partial military mobilization to get a whole bunch of uh, conscripts, so effectively reservists, 
on to the front lines. So uh, the Russian media has reported three more military enlistment officers uh, were set on fire in Russia um, amid this mobilization decree by Putin on the 21st of September. Now this interesting little uh, map is uh, it's, a, it's a map of arson attacks against Russian uh, military structures, mainly enlistment officers uh, across really almost the entirety of Russia. Now, since it might be a bit hard to read, uh, just note that the, the 37 blue flames uh, was attacks on, for instance, military enlistment officers uh, prior to the mobilization announcement on the 21st of September, so five days ago. And the 17 orange fires happened just in the last five days since the, the mobilization announcement. So quite ramping up, really, you could say. 17 in five days. Oh, and one thing to mention, I, I said it was arson. More uh, specifically, it appears Russian civilians or civilians that are to be conscripted are usually performing these arson attacks with Molokov, uh, Mol Molokov cocktails. Sorry, can't get my words out today. Molotov cocktails. And you might remember the Molotov cocktails uh, were created by the Ukrainian, really, civilians at the beginning of the war when uh, Russian forces were trying to invade. Uh, there's plenty of photos and video of uh, civilians in Kiev just, just throwing homemade Molotov cocktails at the Russian forces. So, weapon of choice for many. And in some other news, uh, a number of videos posted on social media show protesters shouting down with the war in uh, the, the capital of uh, Dagestan, which is, uh, which is within Russian, the Russian Federation. Now, more than 1,300 people have already been detained for participating in these protests. Uh, probably good to note at this point, and you, you may already sort of half know, but it is illegal to protest in Russia particularly protesting anything that's uh, anti-government. Now, the Russia's constitution originally allowed protesting, but then, of course, a law was signed uh, and introduced in 2014, saying you can now get detained for up to five years for, uh, you know, or, or go up to, sorry, you can get now get detained or go to prison for up to five years for protesting. And they seem like laws that are selectively geared towards any anti-Putin or anti-government sentiment for sure. So in other words, when you see Russians protesting online, that's a big deal, that's huge. Because they, they firstly have to determine like the, the general citizenry, if they're going to protest, when they're gonna protest, how they're going to do it. Uh, it's not something where they'll just wake up and start doing it. It's, uh, they've gotta have a conscious decision to say, hey, I may be thrown in the slammer for this. So that's, that's how important it is to, to potentially many Russians. And then in some related news, a, a Russian draft commissioner was shot and wounded in the city of Ostelimsk in the Irkutsk uh, Oblast in Russia. So it's certainly not a, uh, you know, amid the, the mobilization decree, certainly not a, a loved situation by by Russia more and more and uh, there's no shortage of this news to be honest I'll probably put a cap on it but I think it is important to mention it every now and then because we even have a uh, a Muslim uh, minority in in Russia uh, these are like uh, pro Muslim women protesters saying we are not blind Russia attacked Ukraine Russia is on foreign soil no to war so again no shortage of these sorts of clips so that's pretty much it, guys. So I'm just keeping it a little bit light and easy today, uh, just because, you know, getting back into the swing of things. Uh, long weekend, lots of technical issues, but, uh, you know, here I am again, just doing a bit more. So, yeah, thanks for watching. Please leave a comment, subscribe, hit that like button, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.